Chapter 8 of The Air Lords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Hypnotic Torture. Some twenty minutes later, the ship arrived. It settled down slowly into the ravine on its repeller rays until it was but a few feet above the treetops. There it was stopped and floated steadily while a little cage was let down on a wire. Into this I was hustled and locked, whereupon the cage rose swiftly again to a hole in the bottom of the hull into which it fitted snugly, and I stepped into the interior of a craft not unlike the one with which I had had my fateful encounter, the cage being unlocked. The cabin in which I was confined was not an outside compartment, but was equipped with a number of viewplates. The ship rose to a great height, and headed westward at such speed that the hum of the air past its smooth plates rose to a shrill, almost inaudible moan. After a lapse of some hours, we came in sight of an impressive mountain range, which I correctly guessed to be the Rockies. Swerving slightly, we headed down toward one of the topmost pinnacles of the range, and there unfolded in one of the viewplates in my cabin a glorious view of Lotan the Magnificent, a fairy city of glistening glass spires and iridescent colors, piled up on sheer walls of brilliant blue on the very tip of this peak. Nor was there any sheen of shimmering disintegrator rays surrounding it to interfere with the sparkling sight. So far flung were the defenses of Lotan, I found, that it was considered impossible for an American rocket gunner to get within effective range, and so numerous were the disray batteries on the mountain peaks and in the ravines in this encircling line of defenses, drawn on a radius of no less than a hundred miles, that even the largest craft, in the opinion of the Hans, could easily be brought to earth through air-pocketing tactics. And this I was the more ready to believe after my own recent experience. I spent two months as a prisoner in Lotan. I can honestly say that during the entire time every attention was paid to my physical comfort. Luxuries were showered upon me. But I was almost continuously subjected to some sort of mental torture or moral assault. Most elaborately staged attempts at seduction were made upon me with drugs, with women. Hypnotism was resorted to. Viewplates were faked to picture to me the complete rout of American forces all over the continent. With incredible patience and laboring under great handicaps in view of the vigor of the American offensive, the Han Intelligence Department dug up the fact that somewhere in the forces surrounding New York I had left behind me Wilma, my bride of less than a year. In some manner, I will never tell how, they discovered some likeness of her, and faked an electronoscope picture of her in the hands of torturers in New York, in which she was shown holding out her arms piteously toward me, as though begging me to save her by surrender. Surrender of what? Strangely enough, they never indicated that to me directly, and to this day I do not know precisely what they expected or hoped to get out of me. I surmise that it was some information regarding the American sciences. There was, however, something about the picture of Wilma in the hands of the torturers that did not seem real to me, and my mind still resisted. I remembered gazing with staring eyes at that picture, the sweat pouring down my face, searching eagerly for some visible evidence of fraud, and being unable to find it. It was the identical likeness of Wilma. Perhaps had my love for her been less great, I would have succumbed. But all the while I knew subconsciously that this was not Wilma product of the utmost of nobility in this modern, virile, rugged American race, she would have died under even worse torture than those vicious Han scientists knew how to inflict, before she would have pleaded with me this way to betray my race and her honor. But these were things that not even the most skilled of the Han hypnotists and psychoanalysts could drag from me. Their intelligence division also failed to pick up the fact that I was myself the product of the 20th century and not the 25th. Had they done so, it might have made a difference. I have no doubt that some of their most subtle mental assaults missed fire because of my own 20th century denseness. Their hypnotists inflicted many horrifying nightmares on me, and made me do and say many things that I would not have done in my right senses. But even in the 20th century, we had learned that hypnotism cannot make a person violate his fundamental concepts of morality against his will, and steadfastly I steeled my will against them. I have since thought that I was greatly aided by my newness to this age. I have never, as a matter of fact, become entirely attuned to it, 
and even today I confess to a longing wish that man might travel backward as well as forward in time. Now that my Wilma has been at rest these many years, I wish that I might go back to the year 1927 and take up my old life where I left it off, in the abandoned mine near Scranton. And at the period of which I speak, I was less attuned than now to the modern world. Real as my life was and my love for my wife, there was much about it all that was like a dream, and in the midst of my tortures by the Hans, this complex, this habit of many months, helped me to tell myself that this too was all a dream, that I must not succumb, for I would wake up in a moment. And so they failed. More than that, I think, I won something nearer to genuine respect from those around me than any other Hans of that generation accorded to anybody. Among these was San Lan himself, the ruler. In the end, it was he who ordered the cessation of these tortures, and quite frankly admitted to me his conviction that they had been futile, and that I was in many senses a superman. Instead of having me executed, he continued to shower luxuries and attentions on me, and frequently commanded my attendance upon him. Another was his favorite concubine, now Lan, a creature of the most alluring beauty, young, graceful, and most delicately seductive, whose skills in the arts of sciences put many of their doctors to shame. This creature, his most prized possession, San Lan, with the utmost moral callousness, ordered to seduce me, urging her to apply without stint, and to its fullest extent, her knowledge of evil arts. Had I not seen the naked horror of her soul, that she let creep into her eyes for just one unguarded instant, and had it not been for my conviction of Wilma's faith in me, I do not know what, but suffice it to say that I resisted this assault also. Had San Lan only known it, he might have had a better chance of breaking down my resistance through another bit of femininity in his household, the little nine-year-old Princess Lu Yan, his daughter. I think San Lan had something of real affection for this sprightly little mite, who, in spite of the sickening knowledge of rottenness she had already acquired at this early age, was the nearest thing to innocence I found in Lotan. But he did not realize this, and could not, for even the most natural and fundamental affection of the human race, that of parents for their offspring, had been so degraded and suppressed in this vicious Han civilization as to be unrecognizable. Naturally, San Lan could not understand the nature of my pity for this poor child, nor the fact that it might have proved a weak spot in my armor. But had he done so, I truly believe he would have been ready to inflict degradation, torture, and even death upon her to make me surrender the information he wanted. Yet this man, perverted product of a morally degraded race, had something about him of true dignity, something of sincerity in a warped, twisted way. There were times when he seemed to sense vaguely, gropingly, wonderingly, that he might have a soul. The Han philosophy for centuries had not admitted the existence of souls. Its conception embraced nothing but electrons, protons, and molecules, and still was struggling desperately for some shred of evidence that thoughts, willpower, and consciousness of self were nothing but chemical reactions. However, it had gotten no further than the negative knowledge we had in the twentieth century, that a sick body dulls consciousness of the material world, and that knowledge, which all mankind has had from the beginning of time, that a dead body means departed consciousness. They had succeeded in producing by synthesis what appeared to be living tissues, and even animals of moderately complex structure and rudimentary brains, but they could not give these creatures the full complement of life's characteristic, nor raise the brains to more than mechanical control of muscular tissues. It was my own opinion that they never could succeed in doing so. This opinion impressed San Lan greatly, I had expected him to snort his disgust, as the extreme school of evolutionists would have done in the twentieth century. But the idea was as new to him and the scientists of his court as Darwinism was to the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries. So it was received with much respect. Painfully and with enforced mental readjustments, they began a philosophical search for excuses and justifications for the idea. All of this amused me greatly, for of course, Neither the newness nor the orthodoxy of a hypothesis will make it true if it is not true, nor untrue if it is true. Nor could the luck or willpower with which I had resisted their hypnotists and psychoanalysts make what might or might not be a universal fact one whit more or less of a fact than it really was. 
but the prestige I had gained among them, and the novelty of my expressed opinion, carried much weight with them. Yet did not even brilliant scientists frequently exhibit the same lack of logic back in the twentieth century? Did not the historians, the philosophers of ancient Greece and Rome show themselves to be the same shrewd observers as those of succeeding centuries, the same masters of the logical and slaves of the illogical. After all, I reflected, man makes little progress within himself. Through succeeding generations he piles up those resources which he possesses outside of himself, the tools of his hands, and the warehouses of knowledge for his brain, whether they be parchment manuscripts, printed book, or electronal recordographs. For the rest he is born today, as in ancient Greece, with a blank brain, and struggles through to his grave with a more or less beclouded understanding, and with distinct limitations to what we used to call his think tank. This peculiar reflection of mine proved unpopular with them, for it stabbed their vanity, and neither my prestige nor the novelty of the ideas was sufficient salve. These Hans for centuries had believed and taught their children that they were a super race, a race of destiny. Destined to whom, for what, was not so clear to them, but nevertheless destined to elevate humanity to some sort of super plane. Yet through these same centuries they had been busily engaged in the extermination of weaklings, whom, by their very persecutions, they had turned into supermen, now rising in mighty wrath to destroy them, and introducing themselves to the depths of softening vice and flabby moral fiber. Is it strange that they looked at me in amazed wonder when I laughed outright in the midst of some of their most serious speculations? End of chapter 8